Dum -bum -bum. Hey everybody, Last Outrider here with a follow-up on my Primarchs and Angron video. I've had a lot of discussions about this video with diehard Chaos players who love to believe that Angron worshipped corn. To which I end all of the discussions by saying, show me anywhere in all of the fluff that has ever been written where it ever said Angron started worshipping corn. Now, they show me lots of examples where the, the world eaters started worshipping corn after Angron was corrupted, sacrificed. But no one has ever been able to show me where Angron turned around one day and said, you know what? I like corn because it doesn't exist but I'm going to bring the debate to an end by reading you from this book Whee! see it the betrayer by Aaron Dimsky Bowden if you don't want to hear the whole snippet I'll just give you uh, the blurb on the back <clears throat> the shadow crusade has begun Whilst the Ultramarines reel from Kor Ferran's surprise attack on Kalf, Lorgar leads the rest of the word bearers deep into the realm of Ultramar, their unlikely allies, Angron and the World Eaters, seem blind to the true goals of the mission. Preferring instead to ravage each new civilization they come across. But where Logar might once have chastised his wayward brother, now he seems only to encourage the frenzied bloodletting. Worlds will burn, legions will clash, and a Primarch will fall. And the fate of the entire galaxy hangs in the balance. Okay, so that should give you enough of a hint. But for those who prefer a more in-depth reading, I give you the actual fall of Angron, where he is sacrificed to corn by Lorgar. Never worshipped him. Just, just think about Angron's backstory. Here's a person who was born a slave, forced to fight in gladiatorial arenas his whole life, leads a rebellion against that. And you think that this person would then turn around and say, Corn, the embodiment of mindless bloodshed and violence, and say, hey, that's a guy I like. I think I'm going to start following him. It's absurd. No. He was picked because of his rage and sacrificed the corn for that reason. He was a sacrifice. Of all the legions, the world eaters were the most, how can I say, abused in the entire Horus Heresy. They are uh, the most tragic of any of the stories in 40k, and there's a lot of tragic stories in 40k, but the word bearers take the cake, and I'm going to prove it with finality over the next 10 minutes. We begin on page uh, 380, where, uh, uh, let me see, Angron is fighting Gilliman, who chased him because of their, their, all of the other 200 worlds, I think, they put to the torch. Not just destroyed, but tortured the populations of 200 of Ultramar's worlds for apparently no military reason. Finally, uh, Gilliman catches up with Angron and they fight. And we are at the end of that. And Lorgar shows up and let's see what happens. The crescendo of the warp song played through an instrument of perfect, depthless fury. 
No purer emotion than rage. Angron himself had said those words. Once the pain had passed, perhaps he'd even agree with them once again. Angron himself still fought Gilliman, standing above the kneeling ultramarine. Had he even noticed the storm of blood streaming from the sky in a red torrent? Sparks, sprayed from Robot's raised gauntlets as he struggled to ward off blow after blow. He was beaten. He was down. Wounds painted him, a palette of proud defeat. Even now his warriors were fighting to retrieve him. With the scarring across his armor and the sense of pain bleeding from his mind, Lorgar reckoned his brother would be lucky ever to even walk again. Angron looked little better. Already an icon of mutilated majesty, huge rents and gashes marked his flesh from the knuckles of Gilliman's gauntlets. Now. It has to be now. Lorgar focused his concentration on the triumphant form of his mutilated brother, calling for the Neverborn to answer in kind. He locked Angron's muscles, setting fire to the synapses in his brain. He stole the chance at a killing blow, fueling the world eater's rage even higher. The screaming began. A melody of murdered worlds finally singing in the material realm. History repeated itself. Another Primarch crawled away from Angron's wrath. Another brother who'd come into an inheritance without being cursed, without being torn from his roots and left to mourn what might have been. There was no pleasure in beating them. The rage never faded. It only deepened, turned rancid by bitterness. The hope for serenity of battle fled from him, deserting him with the hollow promises of a false lover. Hatred offered no victory. Nothing did. Even those he defied and destroyed, even they pitied him. Forgive me. I tried to tell you. All of us dance to the warp's tune. Even you, Angron. This time, as Gilliman, rather than Russ, dragged himself clear, the World Eater staggered back himself, clawing at the ruin of his face and chest. He was tearing at his own armor and flesh, ripping it away in fistfuls, screaming a sound that no living thing should ever be able to make. Flesh and bone, blood and soul, his body vibrated with the warp's tidal rhythm. It rang through every atom, every subatomic particle of his divinely wrought form. Billions and billions of screaming souls. And with their cries came the pain. The first spasms racked their way through Angron's sinews, turning his blood to quicksilver, then to lava, and at last to holy fire. His cries of thwarted rage were tainted by an agony beyond comprehension. His body started tearing itself apart, growing, rising, perfecting. After a lifetime of broken torture, Lorgar stared at his brother's angry agony with guilty joy. 
you were always the conduit. No one else hates the way you do with the same depthless strength. No one else feels such pain, violated by life's treacheries. It had to be you. In the deepest moment of rage and sorrow, there could be no other conduit. Gilliman was escaping into his son's defiant phalanxes, retreating an enviable unity as they waded down the flooded roads. Lorgar saw the expression of disgusted awe on his brother's face as the wounded ultramarine stared at Angron atop the mound of dead sons from all three bloodlines. The 13th Legion still fired, even in retreat. Their shells crashed against Angron's bare, muscled meat, straining his skinless flesh black bursting gouts of blood into the drumbeat. A drumbeat. The gunfire was just a drumbeat, adding to the great song's crescendo. Bolts thudded into him, blasting viscera free in sloppy arcs. They did nothing at all. Angron had transcended corporeal pain in the grip of heavenly torment. Lightning struck him, forming another part of the great song. Even Logar had not expected that. And more bolts of lightning snapping down from the bleeding sky, igniting the world eater's primark the corpses at his boots, and the very earth around him. The fire burned red, formed of flickering, writhing ghosts, the lives of those lost in exchange for his. The blood rain fell harder, hotter now, hot enough to fog and bleached the paint from the cracked ceramite of countless warring warriors. Lorgar never ceased his chanting, naming the names, calling upon them to obey as they promised. He'd given them oceans of blood and worlds aflame. Now they owed him. He'd sold trillions of lives in exchange for one. Let it never be said that Logar Aurelian wasn't a loyal brother. The inferno that had been Angron of the World Eaters raged unchecked. Doubt's first kiss touched Logar in that moment. He couldn't make out anything through the sanguine blaze. Was Angren even within that conflagration? Had the gods annihilated him in reparation for some flaw in the great song? He reached out with his psychic sense, questing towards the bale flame. All he could hear was the wailing of the unfairly slain. Their rage, their agony. This was the song he'd composed from fire and genocide, playing now for his brother's salvation. He felt another presence in that moment, something inhuman and vastly more powerful than any mere psychic soul or ghost of Ultramar. This was a voice he couldn't tune out, and for a moment of absolute ecstasy, he believed one of the four had come to bless his efforts. 
I am no god. The voice was softened by amazement, but nothing could conceal the power in its sepulchral tones. I am the communion. The name meant nothing to Lorgar. Aid me, he demanded of the presence. Sadness preceded the reply. I see now. I see everything. You are killing our father. I'm saving him! Ascension! That is how the worthy he is in the eyes of the four. Logar Arulian, said the voice, we will not allow this. And just as they had let themselves drift from their bodies, they pulled Lorgar from his. He was falling. Into the tides behind the veil. Into the song itself. The melody was as much harsher acidic tone on this side of reality. It washed over his flesh, burning and boiling, running into his mouth and filling his lungs. He rejected this invasion, channeling his concentration into a repelling force. It did nothing. If anything, it made the fire water sear hotter against his body. Lorgar raked his hands against the uncolors of the warp, forcing sense into the senselessness. Vision resolved into something a flesh and blood mind could process in a realm of the unreal. He wasn't falling. He was being pulled down deep under the blackest of tides. He was drowning. With his crozius in his hands, and then light. Something had blazed within its own inner light, dividing him, chasing him down. A world eater. No, a warhound. The armor was a serene pale blue, marked with white. On its shoulders reared the red dog of war, that old abandoned symbol consigned to the vaults of memory. The warhound matched the Primarchs in size. Even without its corona of coruscating light, the two figures met as they fell together, axe against maul, and sound of psychic iron on psychic iron, sending ripples through the tides of unreality. You are an echo, Lorgar told the ghostly warrior, a revenant, a nothing. The warrior turned in the swirling black. I am the communion. Their weapons met again and again, sending the same ripples out into the sea of souls. Each time they clashed together, the warp itself screamed in answer. Faces melted out of the fire water to deliver their shrieks, then sank back into the primal matter from whence they came. The warhound's helmet was an older design, calling back to the more innocent, easier days when the Imperium's ignorance allowed its people to feel safe. The sight of it made Lorgar laugh. You are a relic, he told the warrior. Our legion has suffered more than any other, Lorgar Arulian. The low voice was a knight's old and righteous threat. Enough! Enough! You will not corrupt our lord! 
I am saving him! Lorgar spoke through clenched teeth. He was weakening in the tides, still falling, knowing his body lay motionless back on Nucaria. He could imagine its armor and skin being inked dark by the blood from the storm. This battle was a contest of wills. Perceived as the mortal mind allowed it. Their weapons clashed again. The warhound pushed against him, but the dissipation of strength was an affliction they both had to bear. Clawed hands reached out from the turbulent water. Lorgar repelled them with a snarl and snikic shove of concentration. The warhound suffered their assault. His whole being focused solely on Lorgar. Trails of smoking white blood streamed away from the wounds clawed in the communion's antique armor. You tried to drown me in the warp? Lorgar was smiling now. But I am just as strong here. I am the archpriest of these powers, little ghost. The warhound sagged, its shoulders straining against the locked weapons. Weaker, weaker. A growl left its throat. Then it struck faster than even a Primarch could follow. It came apart, discorporating into the black water. Lorgar's maul sliced the tides, all resistance gone. The warhound reformed in the Illuminarium's wake, its hands at the word bearer's throat. The psychic manifestation of his Crozius slipped from his hands, vanishing in the moment it left his fingers. Lorgar wrapped his own hands around the warhound's neck, struggling to breathe despite the nether of neither of them needing to do so in this place. Instincts died hard. As they fell in that killing embrace. Tumbling through the tides, Lorgar looked into the warhound's eye lenses and saw just what he was fighting. It wasn't one spirit beneath that helm. It was a gasalt of souls. Another smile creased his lips, more an amused grimace than a grin. Boldly done, though. Lorgar hissed. Very clever! He released his grip, ramming his hand into the warhound's breastplate, right through and into the psychic meat beneath. The warrior tensed, stunned, its grip slacking, but not falling free. Lorgar closed his hand into a fist. Something burst within the warrior's body. Who was that? Lorgar shouted over the roaring sea. The warhound's corona of light faded, no longer throwing back the gloom with such intensity. Was that you? Eska? Ralakas? No. I still sense both of you in there. Lorgar punched his other fist home in the warrior's chest. The corona dimmed further as he burst another sphere of searing liquid in his grip. Lorke? The warhound struggled feebly, almost shaken loose by the current. More hands were clawing for him now. Lorke! Lorgar opened his eyes to the slick rainfall hauling himself to his feet. The inferno still blazed. Had any time passed at all? 
and he still saw nothing of his brother within the blazing core. Weakness seemed to follow him back through the warp, sinking into his flesh and binding there. He was wearier than he'd ever been in his life. The communion died in his mind. The Primarch felt it quit. Literally crumble apart in some untouchable psychic diminishment. And in its place, the Bolter Fire began. So, I believe that's sufficient proof to end this argument. Angron never turned to chaos. The world eaters never turned to chaos. They were sacrificed to chaos in a ritual by Lorgar in which 200 ultramarine worlds were slaughtered and those trillions of souls sacrificed in order to possess Angron unwillingly. But you can read the book yourself if you like. They are a loyalist legion. And one day, Angron might come back, and I can assure you, he will not be a happy guy, if he ever was. But I can tell you one thing. It's going to be killing chaos. That's what he will do date dedicate the rest of eternity to. Probably as like a storm cast eternal or something like that. I can see it. When Age of Sigmar marge, merges with 40k, he'll be one of the, you know, Celestant Lords or something like that. That's what I see coming. So I hope this ends that debate. And if somebody else wants to pull some other fluff out there to say all of this is wrong, please let me know. Until next time. Bye.